Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, my buddy, Pastor Brademeyer, is back. How you doing? Well, you know, I'm doing better than you. You told me you have more snow than I do. I love snow. It, it can do this all day long. If we keep power and we keep heat, life's real good. I, I, I kind of like a good snow day. It, it just sort of reminds us we don't need to be as busy as we convince ourselves we need to be most of the time. Um, and so it's really oh, not so snow bad. Days. Snow days are great for that. At our house, we like to do puzzles and build models and do woodworking on snow days. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're, we're a movie family when it comes to this and uh, board games. Oh, we, big, big, we do that yeah. too, but that's after supper, not before. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So on to, uh, on to rougher thing. You want to you do a hard question? Do I have to? Uh, no, you don't have to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, it's, it's the question that, that basically every religion, every worldview, whether even if you're, you're not religious, it's, it's the question of suffering that you're going to have to address. Why is there suffering? And, and it's almost easier if, if you don't believe in God, because you can just say, you know, stuff goes wrong, chance, karma, whatever. It, it, it's, it's easier if you have sort of a pantheon of, of gods and some of them are good and some of them are bad. Cause you're like, well, I, I upset the lightning God. And so that's why my house burned down. Uh, clearly this is, this is on me. Um, and he's just a jerk anyway. It's really challenging to, to have a loving God, and a world full of this much suffering. So, Pastor, how do I make any kind of sense of that at all? And is sense of that even helpful? Well, you know, here's, I want to give a warning. And then I think we should start with maybe ways that aren't helpful to answer the question before we I get love to wrong answers. Uh, so we get to a good one, right? So yeah. the warning is, we all want to be God. You know, the first commandment is first for a reason, right? And because we want to be God, uh, we want to come up with ways that we can rationalize and therefore feel like we're in control of things like evil and suffering. Mm -hmm. And so the default we have when it comes to this stuff is we like to ask why. Why did this happen? Why did that person and not this person? And what we're looking for is a way to rationalize and compartmentalize it and to put it into intellectual categories that we feel like we're in control of. And therefore, we feel like we've done something with it or can manipulate it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a thing that goes like this, like you kind of talked about the pagan gods. The other thing is we try to buy off some powers that be with sacrifices of various sorts, which oh, yeah, yeah. inevitably, you know, leads to killing people and weird sex stuff, which is always the case with pagans for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fifth and sixth commandment there. You, you're right, though. There's this underlying thing that nobody actually wants to say out loud because it's not very pious to say. Uh, but it's it's a genuine confession that that we have to make. If I was God, I would do it different. Mm -hmm. um, and and we can get into why because God might maybe hopefully be smarter than me, and God might maybe hopefully be holier than me, and God might hopefully maybe have a better understanding of what's going on. But I would do it different. And if I just sort of stick with I would do it different, there's that's a real good way to hate God. Or make yourself crazy. You know, this yeah. is this is one of the things that I think that's important to remember that trying to rationalize evil is never going to work because evil is fundamentally not God, opposed to God, right? And God is the God of order and structure. He's the God that made the natural laws. He's the God that gives us moral reason. He's the God that makes things make sense. Why does the sun come up in the morning? Well, you know, the apostle John would tell us it's because Christ is the logos that orders and makes discernible all reality. Well, that's how God is about. What's evil then? Well, evil is kind of the antithesis of that. It's kind of by nature meant to be confusing. It doesn't make sense. You know, the, the pagans aren't entirely wrong when they say sometimes bad stuff just happens and that's the way it is because that's kind of the world, right? That's just where we are. I mean, this is the reality of sin as a, you know, an ever present concept in reality. You know, it's just, it just bad stuff happens and there's often not a good explanation or reason for it. I actually really like that evil is not supposed to make sense. If God is a God of order, if it's evil, it's probably going to be senseless. Like that, that by its nature, probably a really, really helpful thing to keep in mind. And I've never thought about it that way, but I really like it. Well, and, and again, that's the dangerous thing. You know, like you see here about a shooting, you know, like let's just say something, school, school shooting. And, you know, especially when kids are involved, what's the, all the media do, all the people on social media, they're always trying to find the motive. They're trying to find a letter. They're trying to find an explanation because if we rationalize it, it somehow makes it okay, apparently. Um, I mean, it makes it farther away from us or it makes it at least maybe something we can try and work on stopping. Like I, we just, we want it to stop. How can I do it different? Well, and it makes me feel like that if it's a problem in my life, it's something I can root out and handle. Because part yeah. of this is, and, and you know, you, we talked about this beforehand, right? We didn't want to get all bogged down in the law, but this is what happens. Because part of this is that we we admit yeah. when we look at evil in its nature that the problem isn't fundamentally out 
there in that guy. The problem is right here in me and all the horrible stuff that I see. I, I, if I'm honest, I do things like that, at least in my heart. I might not do them outwardly, but I still hate and want to kill my neighbor. I still, you know, want to break every commandment that there is. I still want to be God. And so the problem with evil is, is, is as much here as it is out there. And which is why when we confront it in the world, what's terrifying, I think for us about it is it also makes us realize that I got it right here in my heart too. I'm, I'm that guy too. <clears throat> right. This is the, the problem with the law is it's, it's how things are supposed to be. The world would be wonderful if everybody just followed the law. But all that really leaves me then is a diagnosis and, and not a cure. Right. So that's that's one thing I think that it's the wrong way to approach this is to try to rationalize it. And, and here's the thing. If you have experienced tragedy um, and you try to rationalize it or find an explanation, you want to know why. Why did this car accident happen? Why did that guy leave the bar drunk at this time and run over that person? I, I'm not going to say you're doing a bad thing. It's just sort of human instinct to try to do that. But right. there's no answer to that besides just the fact that evil's there and it happened mm. and it doesn't change anything. Even if you could rationalize it to the nth degree, the bad thing still happened, right? right. So this is unhelpful way number one because you can pin all your energy into that, but there's never really an end to it because you're never going to rationalize it enough and you're never going to find really that answer that fixes the problem because the problem's still there. You know, if your friend died, your friend is not here anymore. That's just the way it is. And even being able to explain all of it, you're not going to be able to bring your friend back. It's never a good thing. Yeah. The and, second and, thing, go ahead. Go ahead. I was I was gonna say, it never actually addresses where God is in the middle of all of this. And, and that's the one thing that, that might actually maybe give us comfort, right? So w what's the second thing too? Let's, let's keep well, some Well, the second the thing bar. I was going to say that we don't want to do, and I already talked about this briefly, but uh, uh, we try to buy off whatever gods we're trying to you know, manipulate into giving us what yeah, we want, right? Yeah. It turns into either works righteousness and legalism or just, you know, plain old, good old fashioned pagan sacrificial religion, right? Um, this, this it, this, this kind of bargaining that people do, you know? Oh, hey, you know, whatever's out there, if I just, you know, stop, uh, I don't know, doing this bad habit that I don't like, or if I, you know, maybe give some more money to charity, you know, maybe I'll meditate or pray more. And if I do that, then then you're going to be good and make sure bad things don't happen to me, right? You know, this is the kind there's of really, bargaining we get into. There's an evil assumption there, though, because it, it's that God is aware of it and will not draw near to it. Um, like, I, I need to somehow convince him to to be near to my problems. Gotta, that, I think, is the greatest him. evil yeah. Gotta, um, gotta, yeah. And that's, and that's a wicked thing that, but this is one of the default ways we try to approach God. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, this is a whole topic for a whole nother video, but just the, the inclination of the human heart to want to earn God's graces and favor. And so we do come up with these schemas by which to impress him or buy him off or bribe him so that he'll give us what we want. But there's also this kind of thing that happens in when we talk about evil too, right? And it's a very common tactic. You know, if you look at the, you know, the five uh, different things that happen when people grieve, one of those stages is bargaining, you know, that, that we try to argue with the reality or God or whatever and try to you know make some some change based on offering a deal. And I got I hate to break it to y'all, but but God doesn't take deals. That's that's more the devil's domain, you know. <laughs> right. At least the old saying goes, or that one country song I heard that time. <laughs> here's a fiddle. Um, so um, he, here's the thing. Then um, this is this is going to be challenging to to reason with because not because you can't reason with it, but because the answer is is no comfort at all. You, you can actually sort of break this down. Why is there bad stuff if God loves us? Well, the answer that, that comes in this, and this is why it's always bad to help somebody reason through this when they're suffering. So imagine that, you know, let's just say a loved one in my life died. And here I am talking to Pastor Goodman and Pastor Goodman and I are trying to reason our way through this. And Pastor Goodman says, okay, you know, you know by why bad things happen, right? And I go, well, yeah, I'm a pastor. Of course I know why bad things happen. It's because of sin of which I am also first and foremost a sinner, Right? Just like the Apostle Paul, it's my fault that bad things happen because I'm a sinner and quite honestly, I deserve it. The world fact, has a, a name for this too. They call it victim blaming and and they hate it. And whether or not you know it's it's reasonable to hate, you can at least recognize that it's not helpful. It, it's not helpful. Well, and this is the thing, like Paul says, you know, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial, right? And when mm -hmm. your friend is suffering, you know, read through the book of Job. What did Job's friends do? Hey, Job, you're suffering because you're a sinner and you need to admit that and repent. Were they wrong? No, no, they were right. They were pretty smug and self-righteous about it, but it's not helpful because does this fix anything? Does this give any kind of peace or consolation? It doesn't. It just throws salt on the wound. And this is why reason doesn't work here. 
Because any kind of rational explanation that I've ever come across does not satisfy it, ultimately does not give an answer to this. It either leads to despair or the idea that reality is fundamentally meaningless or that God hates us or just at best doesn't care about us or that he's fickle or capricious or, you know, any of those other things. And Mm -hmm. none of that helps. Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's awful. Uh, I, we were talking before, and I said I, I only ever talk about this in parable because it's it's too difficult to to talk about head on. Because head on, we have such an emotional investment in the thing that's wrong that that there's not there's not any sense to to be had. So um, let's let's set aside the the genuine tragedies, the school shootings, the cancer, the fire, the tornado, everything that that sin has wrought in this world. Um, and and then we can talk about my living room because that's simpler. Um, I, I talk about my living room this way. I, I, it, it's honest. So, uh, Pastor, my, my living room is always a mess. Um, I, I have I have two kids, and, and so there's Legos on the floor. There, there's toys. There's stuff where it shouldn't be. Books are open everywhere. And so the really frustrating part is when I'm walking through the house and I step on a Lego. It's it's the worst feeling in the world. It's not, but I, I don't like it. Um, and and so I've I've tried to get my house clean uh, because people have told me that I should because all the magazines uh, have clean houses, and I'm pretty sure I, I want my neighbor's house too. There might be something to talk about there. You know, the easiest but, thing is just to stop getting those magazines and then you wouldn't realize. Well, so here the, you real you don't until you step on the Lego. Like there's no avoiding it. Um but but the the, the thing of it though is is cuz I've I've thought about this. How do I keep my house clean? And um there there actually is a solution that I I think I want to try. Um I, I I would I would just have to murder my kids. I, I would advise against that for a number of legal and theological reasons. <laughs> right. Anybody sends anybody can recognize this is a senseless thing. To murder your kids to to keep a clean house is 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 not love, even if it is order. Um, but that's what we somehow want of God. Just take everybody making the world a worse place and, and send them right to hell. And then you can have a perfectly ordered creation with nobody in it. But Which that's not conveniently love. enough, you know, when I'm talking about this, I never end up in that list of people who need to be gotten rid of to make things good, no, right? It's always like everybody else is the problem. That's a you problem. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but but instead we have a gospel. We 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 have we have a picture of love. Love is not actually an, an ordered house with nobody in it. Love is me going upstairs afterwards and, and I'm going to read a book with my kids in the mess. And I, I can tell them, pick up the mess afterwards. It's good to lean into more order, but but I'd rather be in the mess with them than clean without them. And in well, the same way, where's our Lord? Well, you know, this is, isn't this what Jesus says, right? What greater love is there than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends? That's exactly what Christ does, right? He comes into the mess. That is, he, became, he becomes incarnate, becomes a man. God himself is one of us. And, you know, despite what's been kind of in vogue in TikTok circles and things that I've seen in the last few years and uh, that sort of thing, is, is Jesus didn't become a man just to, like, hang out with us and commiserate with our misery, you know? Um, he didn't, you know, in a seminary, a guy I know came up with this thing called the ditch test about how you look at Jesus. And it's, um, imagine you're laying in a ditch with your leg broken. And so Jesus comes down into the ditch with you uh, and, uh, what's he going to do about it? Well, if you're, if your Jesus is coming in the ditch and he smashes his leg with a rock and he says, look, my leg's broken too. Let's, let's be miserable together. This isn't very helpful. Right. Um, so what does Jesus do? Right. Well, he comes into the ditch. He throws you out of the ditch. And he, um, you know, takes care of your legs, splints you, gets you put back down, he puts you back up on the road, and he actually takes your place in the ditch. And then he dies there um, to alleviate your suffering and to earn for you forgiveness and righteousness. That's what Jesus does. God's answer to suffering is not an intellectual thing. It's not a rational thing. In fact, it often really offends people because it seems so irrational. But what God does about our suffering is he sends his son into the world to suffer and to die to save the world. The answer to suffering looks like Jesus hanging on the cross. Mm-hmm. That's what God does exactly. about it. Right. And, and there we actually have something that can endure suffering instead of just try and run away from it or blame somebody for it over and over again. There, there will be suffering in this world because of sin. That's the reason why. It's not a helpful reason, but it's a true one. So the helpful thing then is what confronts the sin. And, and there you, you, have only, you have only Jesus. Well, and there's two things I think that we take away from that. One is that, right, we have the promise of Christ that sins are not accounted against us anymore. But the other thing that happens through his suffering and death is that he sanctifies suffering. And, you know, for us mm-hmm. Christians, suffering is not this insurmountable obstacle that needs to be dispensed with at any cost. You know, this is why people are arguing for things like euthanasia and assisted suicide. For us, suffering becomes sanctified in Christ, and our suffering actually serves a purpose. It doesn't make it any more pleasant or fun or, un, you know, even it doesn't make it desirable, right? 
but it does have a solution to it. It has an end goal. It helps us to be like Jesus and to see Jesus and to be with Jesus. You know, um, I've been through some nasty stuff in my life, as most of us have. And when I go through it, it strips away from me all the stupid things that I think are important that don't actually matter. Right. It gets rid of a lot of my idols very quickly. And, uh, you know, I guess that's just kind of a crass example, but God uses suffering even for his people's good. Right. And that's, that's something that, that we actually get to recognize there. It's one of the chief things that, that separate us from God is, is our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. He can work a lot of good out of suffering, even though I just want to be far, far away from it. And so the question then isn't, is, are you near to suffering, but is Christ near to you to address it? And and you're right, not just to, to hang out, but to save you. And that, that at the end of the day is all the difference. You will suffer in this life. That's just a given. The question is, do you have a comforter with you, a savior with you while you are suffering or don't you? Because those are your only two options. And I got to say, it's a lot better to go through suffering with the comforter, the Holy Spirit, with Christ, my savior, with my eyes fixed on my father in heaven who sent them to me to be with me out of his great love. Otherwise, what do I have? Suffering and then I die and life is meaningless. And you know, call me a, an optimist, which I don't ac- get accused of too often, but <laughs> I'd, I'd rather hang out with Jesus and, and actually see some purpose to all this. Right. I love it. So so then when, when we're confronted with it or, or when we're confronted with somebody who, who says, you know, how could a loving God let this happen? Where was God when this happened? What do we say? Like, just what what what's the answer? And the only answer is give people the goods, right? Give them the gospel. Mm-hmm. Well, where was God in this? Well, he, he died for us. He died to redeem us. He died because this stuff happens. That's why we have this faith in Christ. That's why we have this Savior. Jesus doesn't save us in the abstract. He saves us from sin, death, and the mm-hmm. devil. And you want to talk about what that looks like in the concrete? It looks like this particular thing that we're talking about, whatever that may be. And the only it. solution to it is Christ. Thank you, Pastor, for, for tackling a tough one. Uh, but it's an, it's an important one, so I appreciate it. No, you're very welcome. All right. Have a good one, my friend. I'll talk to you later.